debut on Nonprofit Radio, Heidi Johnson. She's a co-founder of Spiritual Care Guild, providing 24-7 chaplain support to Children's Hospital Los Angeles, where she serves on the Board of Trustees. She's the creator and founder of Charity Matters, a weekly blog and podcast that for over a decade has told the stories of nonprofit founders and their entrepreneurial journeys. It's at charity-matters.com and at Charity Matters. Heidi Johnson, welcome to Nonprofit Radio. Thank you, Tony. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm glad. Thank you. My pleasure as well. So you've been a founder. You took over from a founder. Uh, I presume that in the organization that you founded, you didn't leave things as bad as you found them when you took over from the founder. <laughs> let's, well, let's about, well oh, I, did, did, no, I've you gone didn't. through it all. I've been through it all. Let's yeah, just put it that yeah. way. I, I've walked the walk. I've walked the walk. And, I, and I'm happy to share it. <laughs> let's start the part of the journey with taking over from the founder. Because uh, that's what we want to avoid folks having to deal with. You know, what what did it look like? What did you have to go through? So tell us that. Uh, that you chapter know, founder. it is um, I, I refer to myself as the, the, the second wife, the stepmom. Um, everybody loves their mom. And the stepmom, you know, the person who comes in second is usually not as popular. And um, and the founder is a beloved person. The founder is is so many great things. And, and I, I have to say that I do think founders are some of the best humans on this planet. I mean, they are they are the charisma for their organization. They are the why they have the spark. They have the fire. They do beautiful things. They're entrepreneurs like I, I have just the utmost respect for every founder I've ever talked to. I, I love these people. However, however, I think most founders don't have um, a transition plan, a succession plan. And I found myself in the um, predicament of having walked away from the nonprofit that I co-founded with a group of people and inheriting one that was um, 32 years old at the time and had been founded by um, a nun. So she was super beloved. Oh gosh. And, oh oh yeah. You're on top of that. Oh, a nun. Oh yeah. Nobody and ever the, wants to cross, nobody wants to cross a nun. No, they're, you they're can't. Afraid they're going to get their knuckles slapped with you're, a ruler. You're going to hell, right? Nobody I mean, would it's, ever cross a nun. It's, it's worse <laughs> than crossing a priest. <laughs> exactly. So, so I, I come in and this organization has been a youth leadership organization where these, you know, 17,000 alumni have spent their summers with this woman who was like their mother and she is beloved by all. And she was ill and not well and just said to the board, I'm going to just close the organization. And the board said, oh, no, 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 no. You don't just shut a nonprofit because you're leaving. Um, That's not how that works. And so it was it was not a um, smooth exit strategy because there was no succession plan um there was a lot of hurt feelings from obviously what i would call her kids our alumni who loved her and felt like she was sick and being shoved up by the board it was it was a big mess and i knew none of this when i was hired right i knew none of it you didn't know the history even i i knew that she was ill and was leaving that's what i was told so of course I uncover this pretty early on yeah. into my lay person, lay person coming, <laughs> lay person not coming a religious. in. Yes. Yeah. And, um, and it, it seriously, I, 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 I've never been a second wife. I think, you know, knock on wood, but I felt that, um, that disconnect from our core base, um, the board was supportive of me. But yet the board was still made up of people that were kind of on her team and wanted to talk about, well, we always do it this way. This is the way we do it because this is the way we do it. Not because it's the right way, but because this is what we do. And and so just the battle started from the beginning. You know, it was just, that was just, that was like, you know, the first month. (laughs) Yeah, that that was, okay. That was all the first month. (laughs) Was there staff too, or was it just the executive? Yes, yeah, so there are very small staff, a um, couple staff, a lot of volunteers. Um, some volunteers said, just point blank, I won't even speak to you. 
like I don't want to know you. I don't want to work with you because that harsh, really that, that harsh. Yeah. I don't want to. I don't want to know. I don't want to know you at all. I, I don't want to give yeah. you not a chance. No. And, and that was kind of my. Um, and mind you, I had been interviewing nonprofit founders um, already for probably four years, three or four oh. years at this point. Okay. So I'd been interviewing nonprofit founders for Charity Matters, and um, and loving nonprofit founders and find myself in this situation. So it was so interesting having been a founder, having interviewed founders, and now I am the second wife and I'm trying to navigate through this muddled transition. Um, Very interesting. I thought, uh, I assumed that uh, it was joining this organization that kicked off your interest in, in talking to founders no. and research and uh, yeah, you had already no. been doing it. And then and unknowingly, you find exactly. yourself as the as the step wife, uh, the second right. uh, the second wife. After yeah. starting a nonprofit as a volunteer with a group of um, friends, I just became fascinated with who are these people that do this work. This work is incredibly hard, and and why would you do this work? I really just was fascinated with that. I knew that I had like a backstory and a catalyst and a moment that triggered me to want to do this work. But I was like, who are these other 1.6 million people and what's their story? And, and by the way, why isn't the world talking about them? And at that time, CNN Heroes wasn't on, People Magazine Heroes amongst us. There was, there was nothing 10 years ago. There was really nothing about these people that, that truly are my heroes. So I just started my own personal quest um, as I walked away from spiritual care after running it for five years, I was like, who are these people? I need to find my my people, my tribe. And I went in search of them and started Charity Matters um, to start talking to founders. And right. so that, so midway to my journey with Charity Matters, you know, this other nonprofit um, came to me and said, will yeah. you, what, will you take over? What was the work of that nonprofit that you took over? Was it, was it the camp? It was so it's, yeah, so it's called Task. We are a youth leadership organization, a Catholic youth leadership organization, and it used to just be a summer program to teach leadership um, in Catholic schools. And um, we were serving 300 kids when I took over, um, and now we're serving 3,000. And you know, we have a staff. All right. of, uh, so all right, so yes, ten, we're small. Uh, we're a small well, nonprofit. Say, say the name of the organization again. Task. T A C S C. It's a okay. horrible acronym. <laughs> okay. Uh, all right. So were there people who I, I, it doesn't matter. Board members, volunteers, maybe among the small employee staff, were there folks that recognized that the previous leader had been holding the organization back? Or was it just so much love for her that there was no, everybody was blind? There was, it, there was mixed. There was a mixed bag. I think um, our biggest donor um, who had supported the organization for a long time and was also on the board uh, realized that the organization could be more. And, and he's an incredible leader and visionary. And he, he was really the one, and because he had the deep pockets too, said, we need to hire someone and, and our foundation will, will support this role. And he kind of led that, um, that task, pun intended, um, that task to find a new executive director. Okay. And, uh, and there was people that were very non-supportive of that. But it, since she couldn't run it, who was going to do it? And, and, and I think people don't think about, they just think that these founders are going to go on forever and it doesn't work that way. It just doesn't right. work that way. And, and, and so the organization, the, right. So the organization was not sophisticated and here's the biggest donor or one of the biggest donors saying, we, you know, my foundation will pay for it. Right. We need to do this. So, you know, they'd be more apt to follow his lead than Correct. maybe a more sophisticated organization, but a more sophisticated organization would have had a succession plan and exactly. would have recognized years earlier that the organization was being held back, et cetera. So maybe, you know, in some respects, it helped the organization, well, that he stepped forward and that they, well, it's hard to say that it helped them by not being more sophisticated because they, they could have been a lot further along than they were when you, when you joined. If, Right, and, and I think just All because right. you're a small organization also doesn't always mean you're, now it's fair to say that you're probably not as sophisticated and you are correct no, in this situation. No. We were not that sophisticated, yeah, so you're spot on. on. The, I'm not basing it on the size. On I'm the basing size. it on the, the um, structure. The I'll try to yes. be as polite as possible. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the fact that the well, founder thank you for had, that. <laughs> I 
I was thinking like <laughs> stultifying effect, you know, the effect that the founder had on the organization. That's what I mean. I don't mean Correct. by size. No, they're and, very savvy. They're very savvy two-person organizations. A hundred percent. Well, and I <laughs> and I think that what happens, and, and we see this not just in nonprofits, we see this in small businesses, is when the the entrepreneur, which nonprofit founders at their core are entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. um, that they 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 and the business become one. The brand becomes one, and there is a blurred line. And I mean, you could use something you know as simple as Martha Stewart or Oprah Magazine. I mean, obviously they are the brand, right? But in nonprofits, it happens. It the same thing happens. And where do you separate the person, the founder, and the mission? And it's critical, I think, for people to be aware of that in their own organizations. Yeah. Heidi, let, so let's talk a little more about, let's flesh out some of the symptoms Sure. of, you know, you've, you've mentioned, you know, the organization becomes the person, the person becomes the organization, but what does that, you know, a little more detail, what, what, are the, what does that look like? Well, there's a, I think there's a, lo a lot of things that can happen. I think um, when one, when a board starts um, becoming just so dependent on the founder and so worried that the founder is everything that could be you know, a little sign right there. I think when an organization becomes flat, I think when you don't see a lot of growth, a lot of new board members coming, a lot of new different people coming from different areas, joining your cause, it's kind of the same old maybe cronies club um, or things get a little stagnant. There could be a sign there that, um, hmm, we haven't seen like new, new people coming in. Oftentimes also, I think people rely on the founder as because they bring the passion and they bring kind of the purpose and the why, people think of the founder as their, their best fundraiser. And, and in lots of cases, they are. Um, and they're the community builder. But it doesn't mean that they're the only person that can do that. And, and I think um, it's easy for people to kind of put all that on the founder's shoulders because the founders innately exude that passion for their organization. And so I think that that, that becomes a problem. Um, and I think that that uh, basically what happens is that people just start all of a sudden thinking that the founder and the organization is one and the same, and they lose sight of the mission. And the mission is whatever you're setting out to do it isn't that person. You're there as a community to serve that purpose, to serve people. And if it all becomes about that person, decisions are being based mainly by that person. Every decision has to go through that person. These are red flag warnings. Yeah, everything, right. Everything has to go through them. All the marketing, any languaging, messaging, right, right. Major decisions like the board is just rolling over all the time. You know, you're not seeing yeah. ever robust discussions. Yeah. Right. I mean, there and boards should always have, um, not co healthy conflict, healthy conversation, yeah, yeah. healthy dialogue. You know, you always want that board member that kind of pushes back, that kind of pushes back and says, hey, what about this? Or why is this? I mean, we kind of love and hate that board member, but we need that board member. That it's, it's so important that you don't become placated by just making sure everybody's happy. That, that, that doesn't make for a healthy organization necessarily. So we ought to have a succession plan. Yes. All right. So let, let, let's talk a little bit about the value of a succession plan and then, you know, what, what to do if you don't have one uh, <laughs> and you're, you know, and you feel like you're in this stultifying era with your organization and a founder, you know, how, what, what can you do? Uh, but let, let's talk about the value of a succession plan. You know, what, uh, some motivation for, for spending the time and money to, to create one. Absolutely. Well, I mean, every healthy organization should have a succession plan. And um, I kind of, I'm married to an entrepreneur and he says to me, and his, his words are wise. He said, everything you enter, but a marriage should have an exit strategy. Everything, but a marriage should have an exit strategy. So every time he starts a business or goes into a business, he knows when he's going to leave before he starts, he knows when he's going to leave. And, and he is a consummate entrepreneur. And, and I think that that's really sage advice. Now, for many of these founders, it's a little too late for that. They're too far down the path. They're listening to this saying, oh my gosh, wow, I should have, I should have thought about that. But, but I we think have board, but we have board member listeners too. 
right. who may say, you know, we, we ought to have a succession plan because you, you could get ill. Anything you, can happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anything can happen, right? Anything can happen. So every healthy organization should have a succession plan. And at minimum, I think that if people are starting to even in the organization, bring someone up underneath them, someone that they can, you know, train from within, that they could promote, that is even there in case of emergency that you have at least a net, a person that's a slight net underneath you in your org chart, it, it's critical. It's critical that you have that at minimum in addition to a formal succession plan, obviously. But I think that people get short-sighted and founders especially get so busy wearing all their hats and doing all their things that the last thing they're thinking about is their own succession plan. That's like looking at your own mortality, right? And, and, that's, and that's why so many of them don't have them because they don't want to face the fact that there's going to be a moment that they're going to have to separate themselves from something that they don't know how to separate yeah. from. All right, what if someone is a board member or maybe even a, a senior part of a staff and the, you know there isn't a succession plan? I mean, ideally there should be succession plans not only for the CEO, but for all the C level. Now, you know, now we're envisioning a bigger organization. But let's right. just start with a you know a, a small, small organization. We're talking about a succession plan for the CEO. They're a founder we're a board member or a, or a staff member. How do we raise this with, do we have to start with the founder? Do we start there? Do we, do we have a coup and go to a, <laughs> go to a board member, which is really not the way to. Well, I think it really, I think it really depends. I think, I think it's always nice for, I think it's, there's a, a combo between the coup and, and the conversation with the founder. Right. And it depends on the dynamics of your board and your organization. I think if you have a board member that has a close relationship with the founder, it's really great to kind of tap them on the shoulder and say, hey, if you talk to so-and-so, you know, Freddie founder about um, their, their retirement or their plans for the future, have they ever expressed to you how long they want to be here? And start kind of getting those little seeds planted. I think that would be a really smart, delicate, healthy way to navigate and begin that conversation. Meanwhile, I think it's important that board members on the side are saying, we need our responsibility. Our responsibility as a board member is, is for the success of this organization. We have taken, you know, in lots of cases, signed a legal document saying that we are going to support this organization and and, and well and even if they even if they haven't signed a document under under state law they're fiduciaries to the organization correct so they have duties of loyalty absolutely uh, um, loyalty obedience uh which sounds bad but it's not bad uh, but 100 uh, percent uh, they're and, and all their of our jobs the, the loyalty is the organization not to the person it is all about the organization. It is all about the organization and getting your board to row in the same direction and realize that it is all about the organization going in the same way in the same path is critical. So that might mean a, a coup, a conversation, whatever you wanna call it, a healthy dialogue with, with the board members about talking about if they see these symptoms, even if they don't see them, they should have that plan ready to go. They should have that plan at all times ready. And what does that look like? And, and, and how do we do that? All right. And, and with, the, uh, with the understanding that this applies really to all organizations, whether, 100%. whether you're, you're still have the, you have the founder as the CEO or not, a succession plan is worth the time that it takes. Um, it can be empowering to the folks who now know that they're part of a leadership succession plan. So you're more likely to retain your good talent because they, they know that, that there is a plan for them to advance in the organization. So that's empowering and reassuring to, to people in your organization. Um, and it's just you know, part of the duty of care and loyalty to the organization, the, the organization's future. And, and, and the irony of the whole thing is that as a founder, you know, because there is ego that is tied with it, and I speak as a founder as well, I know that there's a little piece of ego. You do want your legacy to go on. You think about your nonprofit as your child, and you want that to go on and on without you. So part of you is saying, this has to go on. This is what I'm leaving behind. This is my good work on this planet that I have left behind, and I have 
I have started something beautiful that helps people. And then the other part of you is like, wait a minute, who's taking my child? Who am I giving my child to? That's my child. And, and so there's, it, it's, it's complex, right? It just is complex. There's, there's two sides of this and you want the best for your child, but you don't want to let your child go. All right. So let's shift a little now. Now we're, we're in your situation at, uh, at task. You know, how do you start to win over some folks? I don't know. Do you leverage your couple of allies or your one ally or, you know, what, what's your advice for starting the, the movement beyond the, the sweet nun? I can't imagine. <laughs> I can't imagine a, a more. She's a, lovely. A, a she's wonderful. Yeah, yeah. She's wonderful. She there's nothing. There's nothing one. bad right. about our founder, except that she left, right? And she abandoned her children, she got right? Sick and, yeah. And she yeah. got sick. She, there's not, she's a wonderful woman. Um, but right, the so but how you start that transition we, when you come in as a second wife, yeah. um, and, and mom is left and you have, you know, kids that are missing mom and don't really know who you are. Uh, for me, it was the board. The board was, con was made up of um, a group of alumni that, um, that in a way, really, I, I'm the mother of three sons. Um, and there were some of these board um, members, gentlemen, who, who are fantastic, but as a group, they were like a pack of, um, of kids, they had they were alumni. They'd been to camp together. They were a little gang, and they behaved like a little gang. And as a mother of sons, um, my first board meeting was a call uh, before Zoom, and I listened to them beating up on this one person. And I was I was just a board member, a fellow. A board, up on each a board fellow member board. beating up verbally on one. They all picked on one board member. And I, I couldn't believe what I was listening to. And I was that board member up, was that board member present on the call? Yeah, everyone was on the call and the I victim. listened to the these. victim was yeah, on the call. I was on the call. Okay. And I um got off that call and I called each board member and said, you know, and I also sit on a number of boards myself. So I do know how board meetings should be run, not to mention that we teach that at task. We teach kids how to run a meeting. And, um, and I called each board member and I said, I don't know what that was, but that behavior is completely unacceptable. And I am not gonna be part of any organization that treats its members like this. So if you don't call that, that person that you picked on in that meeting right now and apologize, I, I won't be back. This is just unacceptable. Oh, really? You did? And yeah. I called all, I called four men and I told them all the same thing. And they all called this person. And, um, and I was like, oh my gosh, I can't even believe I had to do this. I felt like I was scolding my children, right? It's, it's, and right. then, and you then. You have to apologize. Like, you have to apologize to your, to you your friends. You have yeah. to apologize. But, but you, know, you know, privately shame, publicly mm -hmm. praise, right? Mm -hmm. So I then called um, a priest who was a friend of mine who had been their principal of all of their high schools. And I had served on his board and I called him and I said, you know, I said, Father Bill, I need a little bit of help. I said, payback is a bitch. And, uh, and I, you know, co-chaired your board for five years and um, I need you on mine right now because I need to open a can of whoop ass on this board. And I need someone who's, who's gonna scare them. And you're the only guy I can think of that's gonna really scare them. And so he joined the board and- a bunch of kids, it's, it's a bunch of boys. So you put their principal- 50 year old boys, but yeah. yeah. 50 year old boys, right. You put their principal right. on the- uh, they're, they're I put their principal, them, right? right? Put them right back in their place. Great, and precious. Yeah, yeah, right back in their place. And then his first call, which was my second board meeting, he said, oh, Heidi, you have your work cut out for you. I said, why do you think you're here? And so little by little, it was also trying- turning over the board and there was no board um they had there was no no timeline on board term, commitments we board members limits. have been there for 12 years yeah yeah like what, right. what? No. so, so had to create term the limits bylaws had to be bylaws had to be updated term, term limits. limits had to be created right. turning over the board and getting so the first thing i would tell a new ed or who's taking over from a founder is 
create a board that supports you and at least if nothing else bring in a couple champions on your in your corner you can't you can't start that battle alone you you'll never you'll never make it how do you and the get, other thing that i yeah i have to ask how do you get board members to vote for their own term limits well we had the when, bylaws when this is a brand new this is a brand new yeah. concept to them what yeah. someday we yeah. have to yeah. leave the board you're right what? Yeah. You're 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 as radical as as everybody said. You're and much, and yeah, let me tell you, there was some maker as we thought you were. Yeah, there was right. some very unhappy people. Yeah. There were some very unhappy people, but the people that had sat on other boards and that had a lot of board experience, um, you know, woke up and said, "This is the right thing for the organization." And you had Father Bill on your side too, and I had Father Bill. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. All right. So allies. You got to, you have to have some allies. You have to have allies. You absolutely have to. You, and anyone who does nonprofit work, it's all about your team and a community, right? And that's what we do is we build community and we build connection. And if you can't do that and build that, then you're not supposed to be in this line of work, right? That's okay. So okay. that, I think that's, I think that's number one. That would be my first. Yeah. All right. And so how long did that, process take in uh in sort of evolving these folks off the board i mean did they have to remain for their it, term it, limits it, it so they took a little those, minute it took a little minute years. i would say we our board was our board was um functioning in a and and i do i do like healthy conflict but it was functioning within a year um it was not a well-oiled machine I also said to my board um, early on, I set really clear um, goals. You know, there's there's a lot of great books on turning organizations over and every most of them all say it takes about five years to, you know, turn an organization around, to, to flip an organization, to get it running. And so I kind of said to the board, don't, Rome was not built in a day and I need you to know this is going to take time. And, you know, I inherited a database with 17,000 handwritten three by five recipe cards. Oh no. That was my database. Really? Uh, really. You can't make this up. It you was on index cards? Index cards and beautiful nun penmanship. Gorgeous. But yeah. Oh, oh, her penmanship was uh, exquisite, of Outstanding. course. Outstanding. Yeah. Beautiful. 17,000 yeah. cards. 17,000. Still have oh, them. Yeah. Oh. In the storage unit. Uh huh. Wow. So, so Rome was not built in a day. And I inherited a heart without a skeleton, without structure, a huge beating heart with people passionate for this work. Um, with the zero structure. And so I just said, you know, it's going to take, it's going to take five years and like roll up your sleeves. This is going to be, this is going to be hard. It's going to be bumpy, but we're going to do this. And, um, and, you know, we're now eight years, I'm eight years in and we're celebrating our 40th anniversary um, this year. And, and we have, we just had a board retreat last weekend. Phenomenal. The most amazing group of people, fantastic. And and all of our board members who sit on a lot of other boards are like, this is the best run meeting, this is the best run board. Like, it just, you know, makes me feel really excited when I look back and I have these conversations with you and remember where we were and 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 where we are. So there is hope for anyone listening. There, so. right, right. All right. Um, so you want, I, I, I guess some some advice too would be, you know, keep that keep that goal in sight as you're as you're going through these five transitional years. Absolutely. You know, I mean, it, you know, it's easy for us to talk about, but you know, you lived it day after day through yes. the board transition. There were probably employee, there, there had to be an employee changes. Yep. You know, th th that's a, that's a tough haul for five years. You have to, it's, you got to keep your goal in mind. And, 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 and I think live, setting live that it. timeline for for me and the board, it was, it, it, it kept me, it kept me in the race too. Right. Yeah. Because I said, I'm going to do this in five years. It's going to take five years to get this, you know, completely just, you know, running at full speed. And it's exactly what it, it was exactly about. Right. I mean, it, certainly things got better and better and better, but, um, but I didn't, I think it would be easy to also quit as a new ED, you know, mm -hmm. if, if I hadn't set that goal for myself as well. Because I said to them, this is what it's going to take. And I knew like, you know, and at five years, I got to say, I thought, hmm, should I just put a ribbon on it? <laughs> should I just put a big bow? But but I've just, you know, I, I've loved it, but I've been very, very cognizant, very cognizant. And I almost, um, I don't want to say I'm aloof, um, 
with my, with the kids, but I'm very clear that their job is to love this organization and, mm -hmm. and it is not to love me. They, it is about loving each other and this work that we do teaching leadership. Um, it is not about me. It is not about me. It is all about the organization. All right. Um, the, the founders, I guess we're, we're taking a little step back. You know, you talked about founders having a spark, you know, or passion. Um, just make it explicit how spark and passion aren't sufficient. They're necessary, but not sufficient for launching a yeah. successful company. I mean, yeah. a, a successful business. It's a nonprofit corporation, but it's, it's, right. it's, it runs like a business. It's, it's a business. Why, it's a business. Why, why is passion? It's a business not... with a horrible business model, as we all know, right? A business model that relies on the kindness of others is a hard business model. It's not the easiest business model, but it works for, you know, 1.6 million of us. We make it work yeah. every day. We get up and we do this work. So, um, so it works. I think that um, what's fascinating about the hundreds of nonprofit founders I've interviewed with Charity Matters in the past 10 years is that not one of them, not one of them woke up as a child or said, I'm going to be a nonprofit founder. Not one of them intended for this work to happen. Every single one of them had a moment and something happened. They were on a very different course, every single one of them. And something happened, something dramatic, a catalyst, a really big moment happened to them or someone they loved that forever changed the trajectory of their life. And, and in such a big way that they had to stop their career, whatever they were doing, and knew they had to do this. And I think that that's so um, admirable. And, and it's so, and that's where that passion comes from because something these happened. People who would, these are people who would give up their jobs. Give up right? their job, give up their life, their income, yeah. everything. Yeah. I mean, these people are extraordinary. And, and when you think about it like that, just think about everyone right now has their job, they're working, they're paying their bills, they're feeding their children, and something happens to someone you love, something horrible, or to you. And, and you say, I got to walk away from everything because I need to dedicate my life to this. I mean, that's that's pretty remarkable when you think about it. Of course, yeah. And so to me, that's what makes these people so special. And, and, and their spark and passion comes from that because almost all of them um, are determined if they just help one person who doesn't have to go through what they went through. If one person doesn't get breast cancer, if one person isn't raped, if one person isn't hungry, if one person isn't homeless, they all start out with a very pure intention. They just wanna make sure that they're helping one person. And before they know it, they have an organization and they're driving. And there's a lot that goes into being an entrepreneur that a lot of them weren't prepared for. Yeah. It didn't have the skill set and they didn't, and, and they have passion. And as you say, that isn't always enough. So there's a big spike in activity, maybe the first six months or a year, right? You get family involved, you get friends involved. <clears throat> yep. And, you know, now where do we go? You know, I've exhausted right. my friends and my family. You know, how do I grow this business? And exactly. And there's uh, that. And there's usually if it's something that happened to someone in their family or their community, the community usually knows about whatever this moment was and the community mm -hmm. wants to help. Right. Which is the best thing about um, our country. And as as Americans, we, we are innate helpers and we always want to help our neighbor. So everyone's rallying around in those early days because they're like, I'll do whatever I can to help. But as that, as that memory lingers, as that moment is behind people, as the passion lingers and the reality of, oh my God, I've quit my job and I've started this business and I don't even know what to do sets in, it becomes, it becomes a lot um, more challenging for these small nonprofit founders, 100%. And that's what you hear from the, the, the hundreds of people you've interviewed. That All of them. Are, they, are, of them. are a lot of them in sort of stagnating organizations, leading leading stagnating organizations? Well, I, I think I always ask, a question I, I ask every single person I talk to is, you know, what is your biggest challenge? And, um, and I would say, you know, 85, 90% of them would say fundraising, right? Which I know you know from, this is what you talk about every day with, with your guest. Um, but, but they don't have the 
they, they don't have the skills. They, 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 there's just, they don't come in with any of this. Right. Yeah. And yeah. so it's, it's the learning curve is steep. And then there's just so many control pieces because they're trying to do everything as all entrepreneurs do try to do everything. They're wearing too many hats. Um, you know, you think about it there, there's, they have so many things stacked against them. And the fact that, um, that they persevere is, is rem remarkable because they're the toughest group. They are not giving up. They are not going to give up. They are, they are going to push on. They are going to push on. Let's talk some about uh, service as a leader, uh, a leader in, in service to the organization. Well, I think um, for me, you know, uh, running a leadership organization, which is, which is what I do, we teach, we teach our kids, and I think it's important for all nonprofits to think about this as leaders and every human to think about this as a leader. We teach our kids four things um, that are important for, in order for you to lead. One, if you're going to lead, you have to have a plan and a goal. We talked about that earlier. Like mine was that five-year goal. You have to have a plan yeah. and a goal. You have to be able to communicate that plan and that goal. You know, what's your mission? What's your message? How do you communicate to donors, to people, to friends, to neighbors to get them involved? You have to be a mentor. You have to be a lifelong mentor. And I think in nonprofit, bringing your volunteers along, bringing potentially someone in a succession plan that you're mentoring underneath you, being a lifelong mentor is critical in leadership because real leaders grow more leaders. Real leaders definitely grow more leaders. So mentoring is a huge part of leadership and a huge part of success for your nonprofit as well. And then the most important thing we teach our kids and I think that it's a reminder for all of us is you cannot lead unless you serve. And why did we get into this work in the first place? We got into this work in the first place to serve, to help people. Something happened and we wanted to help them. You know, in my case with spiritual care, we had one chaplain for 300,000 children at Children's Hospital Los Angeles. And we wanted to provide more chaplains and we were there to serve, to make that happen. And that was our mission to provide chaplains of all faiths to this hospital. And, and every single day, that's what we did. And I get up every day knowing that I'm serving thousands of kids that have potential to be the next generation of leaders. And, and that's something that I carry on my back every day. I don't go to bed thinking I didn't make enough pencils. I go to bed thinking I have thousands of kids and I have a lot of kids that have been, you know, locked up with masks and homeschooled and, you know, alienated and disconnected and suffering from mental health. And they need to be connected and they need to, to be connected and learn to lead. These kids are going to lead our future. And I go to bed at night thinking about the kids that, that need to be able to have this experience. So when we're running a nonprofit, we need to think about those that we're serving every single day, because that's why we do this work. It's not about us as the founder. It's not about us and our ego and our brand and our name. It is about the people that we serve. That is why we do this. Heidi Johnson. She's the creator and founder of Charity Matters, the weekly blog and podcast, which is at, or talking about founders and their entrepreneurial journeys. It's at charity-matters.com and at charity underscore matters. Heidi, thank you very much. What a pleasure. Thanks for sharing. Thank you, Tony. Especially for sharing your own story. Thank you.